it's my first time in Bilbao and well it blew my expectations away so it's really awesome city I don't know who's local here in this audience from Bilbao raise your hand no no one oh, too bad so guys I'm missing I would move here so quick agenda we have plenty of time so uh, please interrupt me at any time. We don't need to wait till the end for the questions. So agenda for the next uh, 50 minutes. So I will do a quick recap of BPF, like what it is, maybe a different angle from what you've seen. And then we'll dive into, uh, as Elena said, intricate relationship between like BPF and security and the whole like, well, world of speculation. Okay, uh, let me start with this uh, with this screenshot from the movie Arrival, where uh, actress Amy Adams is trying to explain the aliens how to quit why. Uh, if you haven't seen the movie, spoiler alert, uh, she was successful. Uh, and just like VI, uh, it's not for everyone. Some people hate it, some people love it. BPF is somewhat similar, but what is common is BPF is a sequence of commands that can be understood. So like you probably have seen a uh, different interpretation of BPF from like virtual machine to anything else. So my definition today that BPF is universal assembly language, uh, whatever that means. Uh, and I think the main statement here that is strictly typed assembly language, the very first one, uh, unlike x86, risk fire arm, you name it, the assembly language does not have types. Here you have, like in BPF you have type, like there is no pointer to memory, there is a pointer to certain type always. It's pointer to string, pointer to integer or anything else. So everything is typed. So that's, that's the main difference. And because it's the sequence of command that can be understood, uh, its use cases go way beyond just user space telling kernel what to do. Like now, uh, there are cases that people are working on where the hardware, when you plug it into the like PCIe slot, hardware will tell kernel what it is about. So the hardware will explain kernel its purpose. There are other uh, user space to user space use cases where there's like no kernel involved whatsoever, but you also have a special verifier just for user space and special JIT just for user space. When one computer telling another computer potentially in like other side of the world, like what to do. And comparing it to the, I've been asked this question a lot, like how BPF compares to like WebAssembly or Rust. So the difference is like sandboxed environment, like Wasm, it does not know what is going to execute. Or so like Chrome uh, V8, JavaScript V8 engines, they restrict what is possible because they don't know the intent. They have to like create this boundary of what's possible. And because of it, like there are like, um, Performance slowed down because of the, all of the runtime checks. In BPF, everything is verified statically and there are practically like no runtime check. The only runtime checks are there that verifier cannot like statically prove the safety of the code, but like 99% is verified statically. So the intent is known. That's the major difference between sandboxed and BPF style uh, environment. Having said that, I've seen people who are advocating um, for WebAssembly in the kernel, especially on LWN, there are some people who just love WebAssembly. Uh, my response to that, bring it in. I think there are enough room in the kernel to have WebAssembly or any other uh, sandbox. Um, interesting fact here that in 2013, when BPF was first introduced, it was called IBPF. Uh, from internal, and it took us like three years to eventually rename it to eBPF, and that's how it's like known now. Uh, it was also extended uh, many times <coughs> over the last years. In LVM, we call this extension MCPU of different like flavors, V1, V2, V3. Now in July, we landed MCPU V4 support, and GCC joined the, uh, <laughs> the team. Now, GCC fully supports uh, MCPU v4, and the latest patches uh, that are coming like from Oracle, GCC, and BNU Tools developers, they're going to land, I think, this week. And they say, at like, this point, they will have like full feature, par feature parity with LVM, which I think is amazing achievements. Uh, well, we'll see. 
And I think this is probably one of my important, most important slides in this presentation. I believe that any big project uh, or community got to have its clearly defined mission statement. And mission statement for BPF is two things. One is innovate, and second, enable others to innovate. What it means for like me in particular case that BPF as a like framework, as a subsystem, it satisfies my own thirst for innovation and it enables others to innovate. What I'd love to do the most is to help people on the mailing list when they come in and saying, well, I have this I want to do and I don't know how. And it just like makes my day to help them. And when I see that they are not just trying to like follow the example, but trying to create something new, it's just like the best, the best moment of being like a kernel maintainer for me. And I think it shows in the growth of the community. This is a number of unique developers in the kernel for uh, unique developers per month uh, from 2019 until now. And blue line is external developers and uh, green line in the bottom is developers uh, inside Meta, formerly Facebook. So you can see how it grows. So now we have 100 plus, well, actually combining these two lines is about 120, 130 unique developers every month, which means roughly about 70 to 80 emails a day that team of develop BPF maintainers and reviewers have to, have to process. So this huge volume. Uh, BPF has roots in uh, tracing. Uh, it started, the first hook it was attached to was like K-probes and U-probes, then it was trace points and eventually what we call a fentry and a exit and modify return. Um, the important part here that people somehow when they see like BPF like flushes somewhere, they think like, oh, BPF can do everything. Well, it's actually like very restricted depending on where you attach it to. In case of trace point, it can read all of the kernel data, but it cannot modify none of it. In other cases, when it is, let's say, like networking, it can uh, read the packet data and can modify the packet data and drop them, but it cannot modify the packet state. And in other cases, like security, it actually like prevent system calls and uh, act on uh, gatekeeper on um, LSM hooks. So that's the difference that. I think like very important to understand. Uh, also in terms of uh, like BPF can do uh, everything or nothing, a lot of it comes from um, use cases that been um, used now. For example, if you have an Android phone, uh, you open it up and you want to see uh, how many gigabytes you spend like Facebook versus YouTube. The way Android folks are doing it is through BPF program that attached and they know where the traffic is going and this is how they count stuff. Um, if, uh, there is a, if you ever used the perf tool uh, as part of the uh, Linux kernel that help, helps you with observability, there is a tool written for Python, we call it PyPerf. It's kind of the same but for Python and it shows the stack um, of the um, inside the Python programs and the way it's done because there is a Python calls and the Python interpreter and everything else in between. So BPF is doing this special stack work that is uh, specific to a particular Python interpreter and leaves only the frames that are relevant for performance analysis. Like without BPF in the kernel doing the stack work, this kind of analysis would not be possible. Uh, another use case that is also fun and it may not be like obvious is how um, BPF helps to analyze purely user space applications. It's not attaching to anything to the kernel. It's using what we call uprops. And uprops is not attaching to a process, it's attaching to a particular instruction inside the file, inside, inside the inode. So uh, use case to that, you attach to inode inside uh, GCC preprocessor, and then you type make. And every instance of GCC that launched on the system will have this uprop inserted automatically by the kernel. When GCC starts executing, the trap uh, happens, it goes back to the kernel and kernel BPF program executed. And now it can capture, for example, uh, how much time preprocessor spends doing processing pound includes versus actually compiling the code. 
And this was used by uh, our friends at um, performance of the C++ application to understand whether this whole meta programming in C++ with templates and, and boost and all the fancy stuff takes too much time actually processing the headers versus compiling the code. Um, I've touched on networking a little bit. Um, here, uh, networking was like very interesting as well. Um, first BPF hook that was added was for the, uh, what we call socket filters. It was done, well, this is the eye chart, so you don't need to like memorize it. There's no quiz at the end. Uh, but the uh, socket filters was done because classic BPF and TCP dump, that was the main hook for the TCP dump to use. And I'm sure like you use TCP dump. And because of the history of TCP dump, it was the extended BPF when it was created, we just not to, well, uh, to make it uh, acceptable uh, for the general for Kernel community because BPF was like revolutionary at that time. We did exactly the same as classic BPF did. Classic BPF attached to socket filters for TCP dump purpose. We said, well, eBPF will be doing the same, like, but it can do maybe a little bit more. Turned out this socket filter use case is practically like unused, like no one really used it. The success of VPF in networking came from all the other use cases. In particular, um, for, for this like security-minded uh, audience, the XDP, uh, XDP use case matters a lot. Um, essentially, it's used uh, inside uh, Meta slash Facebook for DDoS protection. It started around 2016. And back then, DDoS uh, as a service uh, all of a sudden became popular. Uh, really, you could, like on a black market, uh, buy uh, a DDoS attack. And well, it's true, probably still, still the case today, that Linux kernel and like all sorts of layers, they're full of security vulnerabilities. So millions of microwaves and cheap Wi-Fi routers were hacked. And there were bots uh, all, all over the world that were selling this access to hacked million of routers. And it was, it started as a service for angry uh, gamers who wanted to DDoS another game server. You will just buy and it would be multi gigabit attack. And because it was pretty much easy to try to attack anything, people were trying to attack Facebook. And we've seen many, uh, all the way to half a half a terabit. I think the worst was half a terabit attack. That's a huge number to absorb uh, for the any service, even as big as big as Facebook. And back then, in 2016, we were using a kernel feature called APVS. I I forgot what it stands for, but essentially it was a layer follow balancer, but done on the kernel but it wasn't like fast enough to absorb uh, this kind of attacks. So that's why the technology XDP stands for Express Data Pass was invented. And what it does, we attach a uh, BPF program right uh, next in the driver. So as soon as, so instead of going, and IPVS is actually operating closer to the after TC uh, around IP, IP area. Um, in, in the layers of stack. So when we can install and run BPF program next to the driver, we remove all of the overhead of the networking stack where it's allocate the socket buffer, SKB so-called, then doing like uh, early DMAX, uh, socket select, et cetera, et cetera, checksumming. The, so running it in the driver, we were able to achieve 10x, 10 times performance improvement versus a PVS. And the main use case of Facebook at that time was preventing, and not preventing, absorbing this denial of service attack, this distributed denial of service attack, which were many, many gigabits per second across the globe. And over the years, the networking use cases grew a lot. Uh, now, Cilium is the <clears throat> dominating plugin for Kubernetes. It's used for networking connectivity and for security as well from the networking perspective. They can analyze the traffic. They can see, uh, they can even do the layer seven HTTP style, well, at HTTP layer, understanding where the 
where uh, requests are coming from and block depending on the security policy. And uh, recent development, uh, thanks to Kipi, who is, who is in the audience today, is addition of uh, BPF LSM. Um, in, together with uh, security hooks and syscall, it's now being used to prevent uh, uh, interesting security attacks. And uh, back to my point that like different BPF programs can do different things depending on what they are, what they are, what we call a program type and where they are attached. Like tracing can read everything, cannot modify anything. In case of LSM, it can read everything and can deny operations. But it also, what it can do, it can sleep. Unlike all previous programs that we did in the past, this one is sleepable. Um, and not only sleepable, it's uh, kernel terminology, it's faultable. So the program can do a minor fault and at that time, if it's a minor fault, when let's say the uh, user address that it's trying to read was swapped to a disk, kernel will actually do all of the swapping of the pages from the swap into memory and will let BPF program to complete this uh, minor fault and fetch the, fetch the data. So this uh, solved uh, one of the concerns that we people had in the past in terms of um, that attack, for example, like if the security, if let's say the BPF program that doing something security and attached to a system call and they're just trying to read uh, user addresses in non-faultable context, if this address is just faulted, like the program, uh, the read will return a fault because the page is not present in the memory and based on that it's possible to like sneak, uh, sneak certain accesses that the program cannot detect. With sleepable, it's uh, like more secure now. Unfortunately, uh, the BPF LSM programs are not that, um, I would say, uh, open sourced <laughs> right now. Like in networking, like everything that people do so far and in tracing, like it's, I would say, 90% of it is open source and public. Every networking program I've seen from uh, Cilium and Nice Island, from Facebook, uh, which is this DDoS prevention, which we call Catran, this is layer follow-up balancer. It's used by Facebook, Dropbox, few other companies, all open source. Cloudflare, uh, one of the biggest uh, protector of the DDoS as well, they also open source then uh, their BPF program. So in the networking, everyone is chipping their knowledge in and showing what they can do. We, we learn from each other, we like educate each other. In the tracing side, it's, it's just as good. Like Brandon Gregg posts, like has this hundreds of the tracing programs that he wrote that do performance analysis. He wrote a book of how to use them and how to develop the new ones. In the security world, it's not that well, well, not that good. <laughs> But I will, I, will get to, I will get to this point later. Uh, and another uh, part of BPF that is in active development now is a BPF Next. It's even hard to categorize what it is for. Like tracing and networking use cases, I would say there is very little from the BPF core perspective that is happening there. Uh, I would say they are 95% solved, and of course 5% takes 90% uh, of the time, but they are pretty much done very little development. For this for the security side, also very little development uh, in terms of like new features where everything like innovative comes in from this BPF next. Uh, the recent feature that landed was called um, HID, stands for Human Interface Devices. What it can do, it can modify, uh, the program can modify your trackball to be seen as a mouse from the kernel point of view. Or if it is a broken mouse, the program can actually fix it uh, between, so the, the challenge there that like when the hardware is developed, the driver is being certified, it needs to go a particular kernel, but then during like manufacturing defects or whatnot, the mouse is actually not operational with particular drivers, so these quirks that can tweak um, how driver like sees this mouse are done with BPF program. So time to market, time to like be able to actually like sell this device with a keyboard, a mouse, or like any interface is like much faster now because of this facility. And three more features have been in active development. Is one is a scheduler, which I'm I guess excited uh, the most about. Um, 
it's a, we call it SCADEX or extensible schedule class. Here, BPF programs are used to tell, to actually, to actually perform the scheduling functions. In the kernel, there is only like CFS and now EVDF. And these schedulers are good for general use case. They're doing as best as they could, but there is always niche use cases and specific like custom applications that benefit from a uh, custom scheduler. One of the examples is a um, cloud environment. Um, there is a, like, if the hypervisor is done in Linux and every VM is running in Linux, what you have is like two schedulers, one in hypervisor and one in every VM, they just compete with each other. The hypervisor scheduler is not aware of how they perform and the scheduler inside VM cannot do it, well, not aware that they actually like virtualizing how scheduler is doing it. So what you see, if you use just a stand, standard like CFS uh, generic uh, scheduler that part of the kernel, you get like mediocre performance from the VM. So, well, mediocre relative, of course, but uh, you can get more out of the VMs, out of the CPU, if you're doing custom scheduling. For example, you can disable the tick. Tick is a uh, uh, timer tick that happens most of the time in most of the configurations, thousand times a second. So instead of doing thousand times a second and interrupting a particular VM that's doing something else a uh, thousand times a second, the schedule just disable the ticks. And now like instead of like thousand times the VM enter, VM exit, especially with all the security consideration, they're quite slow. This is not happening. So performance, performance is uh, achieved. And this was my introduction to BPF, and now um, the history, and now I'm going to the next step that's, uh, I think, more fun. Um, unprivileged BPF. So to explain what it is, got to start from the very, very beginning. Um, uh, it, BPF as an instruction set was invented 30 years ago, and now we call it classic BPF. It's used in TCP dump and CCOMP, and it was all because like TCP dump only needs networking privileges to its uh, CapNet raw to uh, read uh, packets. It doesn't need any other uh, capabilities to uh, read the packets. So it, the classic BPF was, and still is, is completely unprivileged. eBPF followed the same idea, and um, turned out, as I was saying, the socket filtering um, use case was completely unused. They, like in the last so BPF was now nine years in the kernel. It actually, next week there will be BPF birthday. Uh, exactly nine years ago, uh, the facility landed in the kernel. Exciting stuff. Uh, but in this nine years, socket filter was barely used and the only other uh, program type that can be unprivileged that was added over the years is this uh, C group SKB, which is similar, it's like socket filtering, but scoped by the C group abstraction. Everything else is like, was always, always required through it. So all was fine uh, for the first couple of years of VPF existence until in 2017, uh, Jan Horn from uh, Project Zero wrote uh, this bit of code. Uh, anyone remember this? Uh, okay, cool. <clears throat> and, uh, it's, it's, it's actually the snippet from, he actually used three BPF programs as part of his exploit. This is most, I don't know, interesting one, since it's actually doing, uh, preparing the code for speculative execution. And for those who had fun back during the Christmas of 2000, uh, 17 at that time. Uh, this was eventually became known as Spectre V1, uh, Spectre V1 attack, which is a bounce check bypass. Uh, quickly, TLDR is uh, most of the modern CPUs, ARM, Intel, AMD, they're all doing speculative execution. And when CPUs execute speculatively, the effect, the actual like execution is canceled. Like if, if they're like mispredicted and executed something that shouldn't be, but CPUs cannot, by now, still uh, cancel the side effects of the speculative execution. And for the spec v1, this is still the case today. There were like many spectre variants found later, and bugs in the speculative execution in the CPU. But spec v1 is not 
fixable. So it's still, uh, software still have to do the mitigations for it. And how uh, mitigations were proposed. Um, the way part of the vendors looked at it, uh, when it was disclosed, I think in December 2017, um, hardware vendors said, well, that's speculative execution. Speculative execution is all bad. Like it's, it's leaking the secrets, it's reading the memory. So what we can do, we have to stop speculative execution. And the proposal was from everyone, from Intel, from uh, ARM was <laughs> funny at the time. And they're just like, yep. If there is a branch, possible branch mispredict here in speculative execution that can lead the, leak the secrets, just add LFANS. And LFANS is a speculation barrier. It's stop execution. Microsoft did similar. They tweaked the Visual Studio compiler to uh, opportunistically insert LFANSes all over the code. And this is how the windows were recompiled at the time. And everyone said, yep. Yep, that's good. Yeah, use that. And that was the request uh, from the vendors to do the same in Linux kernel. Uh, in the Linux kernel, we decided to do a stance because like LFANs look like a pretty big hammer. So the idea was that uh, we discussed over several months is instead of stopping the speculation, we will manage the speculation. Instead of telling the CPU, don't speculate any further, we will just steer the speculation into being safe. Uh, many months later, in January, we finally, like, well, convincing Linus that it's a good idea uh, was easy enough, and with Linus on board, it was extremely challenging to convince uh, Intel, and it took like six months to convince ARM that this is even like feasible, that this the concept of the steering the speculation is the concept of the masking at the end it was masks of different kind when there is a, when there is an access instead of uh, the speculative like certain the when cpu executes speculatively it's also execute like masks uh, speculatively as well and this masking operation on the address uh, bounds the uh, range where speculation happens to the only addresses that the uh, CPU is supposed to uh, read. Yeah. On the implementation side, it's, it was a big deal in terms of amount of work and arguing on, in private and in public. At the end, this is now known as this array index known spec uh, macro that are then underneath doing this trivially looking uh, or operation and shift, which is nothing but mask, but it had like a huge effect for the kernel and for uh, mitigation of a speculative execution. Uh, right now we have 240 cases, last I counted, in the kernel that use this array index no spec uh, macro. And some of them are used in very hot tasks of the kernel. Uh, one is a file description table. So every access, like pretty much everything in the Linux is accessed through the file descriptor. And file descriptor is an integer and you pass this integer to a kernel saying like, do this. And file descriptor table is limited differently for every different process. So it's certainly an attacked vector. That's why to access this index to a file, file pointer inside the kernel, this array index no spec have to be used. And since every operation, like even read-write of the socket, receive message, write message, using FD, using the index, so this uh, is executed like many millions time a second on any given kernel. So now we imagine if Linux didn't resist this LFANS, LFANS, LFANS push, and we had this LFANS everywhere, so now we would have 240 LFANSs around the kernel, and enabling mitigations, spec, spec, spectra v1 mitigation in the kernel would be well, guess how much slower it would be. Um, but uh, as I said, like BPF was used as part of the um, exploit. And of course we had to fix BPF as well. And on BPF, it's that because it's all like assembly, uh, strictly, strictly type assembly, we cannot use the macro. So we've been using this. Uh, so this is how the code looks when we generate the access uh, load from the map instead of just uh, in the compare, we're doing compare and mask. So that's the only difference. So BPF programs, when they have to be, when they are well loaded 
as unprivileged. So this is still unprivileged BPF. When they are unprivileged, we add and instruction to mask the success, to steer the speculation, to make sure like spec v1 attacks are not uh, are prevented, well, mitigated. Um, but then, uh, short time after, I think it's only like, uh, we were happy only for a couple months, uh, Jan Horn came back with the Spectre v2 attack, uh, which was uh, called branch target injection. Yeah, here it's, uh, because the world was already like uh, steaming uh, from like, oh, BPF is like, must be really scary. In this case, V2, BPF was also used as part of the attack for, well, good and bad reasons. But here, the interesting part that uh, not very people, uh, not many people know that the kernel actually not really involved. There is no verifier involved to attack this, to use BPF as an attack. And in this case, BPF actually completely, the BPF instructions are in user space. The only thing that's being used as part of the attack is interpreter that's inside the kernel. So the whole interpreter, the text, the code as part of the kernel, the interpreter itself is used to speculatively execute the instruction that were never loaded to the kernel. It's BPF instructions in the user space and speculative execution jumps from user space to the kernel, and so effectively the presence of the interpreter in the kernel was able, was possible, um, made it possible for Jan to demonstrate, to create this exploit for the branch target injection. And of course the bug itself is in the CPU, and now this whole IBRS, and then later EIBRS, and, all of this stuff uh, was done to like prevent it. So the, the actual bug in the CPU, but BPF interpreter was used. So to mitigate that, like we cannot do anything, like kernel not running, like there is nothing we can add to the kernel to prevent part of this attack. The only thing we could do is to remove the interpreter completely from the kernel. And BPF is only one of, so at that time we were arguing that, look guys, well, there are actually other interpreters in the kernel. Uh, there are three more at least. And everyone was like, yeah, but BPF is interpreter. That's one was used. So the others, I'm, I'm like, okay. But it, the kernel, my point here, that kernel is not fully safe today. And it's just like people didn't work hard enough to demonstrate how other interpreters can equally be used as part of this like speculation attack. But what we did, we added this config JIT always on, and what it does is completely removes uh, interpreter from the kernel and on the JIT, uh, just in time compiler from BPF to x86 remains. That uh, prevents this uh, part of the part of the attack. So it's interesting also that the, how the uh, perception of the JIT changed. Like back in 2011, like JIT, uh, just in time compiler was seen as uh, something bad, that the kernel should not be doing things, things like that. In 2011, there was a known uh, attack called JIT spraying, where um, parts of the, because x86 is such an interesting uh, instruction set, you can encode instructions as part of the uh, constant. And if you just like, if you have, let's say, move instruction, move some register, some constant, move register, some constant, you have a bunch of them. If you look at them normally, they just like nonsensical. You just move in the constant. But if you, instead of jumping at the beginning, you just shift it by like a byte. You just shift the whole thing by a byte, but because of the way x86 encoding works, you actually will have a completely different set of instruction and all of them will be valid. So that was used as part of the attack, and this is how JIT, JITs can be used to insert gadget, gadgets into a kernel, where the kernel now will have a fixed set of instructions that attacker wanted to have. So this is JIT spraying. So that's long ago. Like it was fixed uh, back then, there was a randomization and a trap insertion like all over the place. Then it was even, uh, we added what we call a constant blinding. Like everything that can be attacker controls, like any kind of constant, we randomize uh, with uh, randomize inside before with JIT, so 
so it's like two layer defense though after the first after the first initial fix of like randomization and trap insertion in 2011 there were no known attack like security minded folks were still worried that something like this possible so we added the whole like constant learning facility so and now because of the specter v2 like jit is now the only way to run anything so well it has to be on but what we also find out is uh red pauline that's used or red pauline um, as part of spec v2 mitigation um, when cpu doesn't have uh, hardware fixes um, it creates significant uh, overhead for every indirect call and having a jit is actually very beneficial in terms of performance because red Pauline mitigated indirect calls that are super slow because they guaranteed to mispredict, like guaranteed to mispredict, so trashing, eye cache and everything. Um, now uh, jitted as a direct calls, which recovers lost performance due, due to red Pauline. Uh, we went further uh, in 2019, a year later after the first spec V1, V2 uh, fund, we've uh, decided to get uh, smarter about what uh, Verifier is doing. And this, um, so Daniel did a lot of work and I believe now, so the key part here is to prevent such, uh, like there was this Jan discovered another way to like craft a fancy BPF program into the kernel. Um, the verifier was changed to like the, the way the verifier works is it analyzes it doing symbolic execution of the code to analyze all possible paths all memory access and this how it knows that all accesses are actually like safe access in known memory in speculative execution what daniel is it this for the very for the verifier to uh, to simulate speculative execution as well so i'm uh, my point is the very what the, the analysis that verifier does is like unique in the industry no other static analysis tool can do this kind of uh, speculative analysis of the speculative execution and not just like guessing like compilers like lvm and microsoft visual studio they analyze uh, uh, abstract syntax trees they analyze the ir they analyze the c c plus plus whatever program and they can guess where the speculative execution would be and they have to be conservative the microsoft was in sort of offenses back then uh, but very far because it's doing the symbolic execution and symbolic execution of speculative path knows exactly like what uh, what and where the speculative execution can happen and can mitigate it which i think is super cool then there was a spec v4 as well and again bpf was used as part of the attack the mitigation turned out to be super simple this is all it took uh, 10 lines of code to sanitize the stack in this particular case um, the root of the attack was that pointer versus con the cpu because speculative execution can uh, uh, can will assume that they're actually trying to uh, load and this is a pointer that's pointer to a memory whereas um, tricky program can actually use the constant there and replace it with something else so we had to add this trivial mitigation trivial mitigation says just instead of like accessing the pointer zero it out so one extra instruction added very easy but uh, it's not the fun again and the calm didn't last that long there was specter in g new gen i guess um and they they just like keep coming we were like bombarded by various like researchers and bi-weekly calls with intel about like oh like we think bpf might be involved again um, and because like in nine years that bpf existed only two program types were ever unprivileged and both of them were extremely niche use cases with number of users less than number of fingers on a hand but like it's just like not worse for bpf community to keep mitigating all of this with like verifier so what we did we added this bpf unprivileged default off sys control uh, important here is the default y so uh, every distro every kernel from there on disables completely disables unprivileged bpf so you cannot so pretty much yeah we just like yeah let 
let uh, security researchers in speculative execution use something else because we're tired of being of BPF being a highlight and uh, always in the spotlight of the security research. We still had the sys control knob uh, that just for some people who like really want to do unprivileged, if they like don't care about security, they're like fine. Here is a knob for you. You can still turn it on, uh, but the recommendation is to turn it off. So that's that's what it is now. So that's been the case for last well many years, five more. Um, and because of the, so in the past it was this unprivileged, uh, so come back for a second, it was unprivileged and root. So root only, root everything root, like most of the program times root, and two unprivileged. And during those years we had constant uh, requests from the community, like can you make this map unprivileged? Can you make this program type to be unprivileged as well? Because like I don't really need the full root, but you're forcing me to, be full root with the full root privileges just to load my BPF program. And I know it's going to be like networking program. I know that networking program can only like access the, uh, read the packets and drop the packets. I don't want to be a full root. Uh, so that's why um, we first have created this uh, CAP BPF. So effectively what we did was split this whole root uh, CAP sysadmin space into uh, um, different domains. So um, first cap perf one was it reduced. It was not part of anything BPF. It was part of the perf subsystem where it would allow to, ins to install and use uh, perf events that can read effectively arbitrary memory. So if you have cap, cap perf one, you don't need any BPF. You can read all the memory in the kernel. So that's, and we added cap BPF that allows to do all of the stuff, um, at least listed here. Effectively, it loads all kinds of BPF programs and can execute them. But in addition, these two lines here are important. So if it is a tracing program, and remember I said like tracing programs, tracing BPF programs that attach to K-probes, U-probes can access all the memory. If you load in tracing program with just Kai BPF, it won't be able to do so. It will be like denied access to uh, all of the like helpers and the functions that allow it to read it. So it will still be a tracing program, but it will be basically basically useless. The user process to load tracing BPF programs would need to have perfmon, cap perfmon, and cap BPF to be able to actually load useful tracing program. And similar, so cap BPF is just like a core BPF features. If you like imagine overlapping circles with cap perfmon, this is tracing BPF stuff. And similar overlapping circle on the other side with the net admin and can BPF allows to load networking. This networking programs you don't need access to like all the kernel memory. That's why you wouldn't even bother with cap perf mode. Um, but so like as I said, like we did it to uh, restrict the root. But uh, in kernel. Uh, now we have this like perception challenge of like what KBPF is actually really trying to do. Um, BPF is not namespaceable in general. Just reading kernel memory means like reading all kernel memory. You cannot say like, oh, load the program. It will be only accessing memory of uh, task within this container. It's just like not possible. Like uh, for the networking, we can restrict it to a particular net and as the particular networking namespace, but that's more exception, exception from the rule. So uh, CAPBPF is really CAPSYS module like. So when you think like, well, CAPSYS module is what allows you to load kernel module. So if you have a kernel module, you allow it to load it, effectively allow it to read everything, including like crashing the kernel. Uh, but so CAPBPF not wasn't trying to do this obviously. Like there is a whole verifier, but verifier is not uh, 100% uh, bug free. There are always bugs, bugs in it. Uh, so, but for the normal model of like capabilities, when people look at capability, like we're saying, well, KBPF should do this. And in this list, mm, does it say somewhere here that KBPF allows to crash the kernel? No. So, well, if you can craft a program that doing like add a memory leak or whatever, it's immediately a CV. People, discover some bug and say like, yeah. So, 
And that's a problem. Uh, recently, there will be an article uh, titled The Bogus TV Problem, uh, talks about um, <laughs> exploit that was a bug, effectively, small bug in curl, uh, user space tool that, that was fixed three years ago in 2020. And somebody decided that, and the bug was in the integer overflow of in the command line. You pass it too big of an integer, it overflows, and the curl thinks it's a smaller number versus big. But this people uh, thought it's a good idea to file a CV for that, and CV was filed, it got a um, uh, severe rating, and uh, immediately like the curl developers were like, well, you have to fix this bug, you have to do like bug ports, they were like going crazy. So the author of the curl wrote this uh, blog post, like, saying that, well, this is security circus, nothing else, no other words to describe it. And at the end, uh, I think Ubuntu now is saying that this is not a CV, um, and it's disputed, yeah, an official term now that is disputed CV. So we see this uh, behavior, no, well, behavior in the BPF subsystem as well, and not the single time. So this is recently curl hit it. We see this uh, all the time. What happens, like people look for the bugs with that we fixed in the verifier, especially if they just can grab for the fixes stack. And how we find out, uh, somebody uh, posted like a patch request to backport to some like all the kernel. He said, look, this is patches that you guys need to backport to kernel whatever, five something. Uh, because there is a CVE to it, we're like, wait, what? And we'll look at the bug. We, were, we fixed it a year ago. That was like one of the verifier bugs. We have many. So we fixed one of the bugs. A year later, somebody created the CVE for it. And, and of course, yeah, backward CVE is like so bad. And it's even, it's even worse. Some of this, like some of the blog posts we see, people just take a self-test that we wrote to make sure that the bug is fixed and then wrap it into the exploit and say, look, if you have an old kernel, here's the exploit, I can show you how you can do this like security like attack on the fix that was made like years, years ago. So, uh, yeah, this is still happening. I think the last case was even like last week, I saw like CV is being assigned for some, Bullshit. And why this is all happening is because, as I said, verifier is not bullet bulletproof. We're trying, but uh, the worst and but bugs happen. It's pretty complex. Bugs happen. The worst, I would say, of all bugs was this um, explicit 32-bit uh, uh, sub-register bounds checking that the commit uh, I'm referencing here was landed in a kernel three years ago and took 12 fixes over the last three years to, we hope, finally fix it. So the commit is not, well, it looked like not a rocket science and multiple people reviewed it. What, is, what it's doing is uh, the PPF has a 64-bit sub-register and a 32-bit sub-register is just like, it matches to x86 and ARM64 instruction set. They both have the same concept. Uh, before the verifier was only tracking the bounds. If you write something, the bounds uh, meaning like what is the range of the value inside the register of integer value. Let's say it's from minus two to five and it's tracking it for 64 bit number. What it did, it started tracking it for 32 bit numbers as well. Let's say you write in only 32 bit sub register, you write in number five there, or like not necessarily five, but the range. If it's a constant, it's easy, but if it's a range, it's getting like complicated. When you have the range, you know that this range, like within in 32 bit, is this range, and 64 bit, it's other range, and then you're doing some like operation, like plus one. So to know, to answer correctly what would be the range of 32 bit and 64 bit later, turned out it's a pretty complex problem. Uh, we thought, so after three years, maybe we fixed it. So, but what, we, what the industry is doing about it? Um, there were three different papers from three different universities over the years where people were focused their research on exactly this problem, how to do the 
range checking and not only how to do them correctly, uh, like um, I think the first, if I'm not mistaken, they have the whole tool that uh, um, tests all possible, like I think it's exhaustive search of all possible combination. And uh, I forgot which one of this paper, they actually go full like 10 pages paper where they do mathematical proof that the analysis uh, that the verifier doing is actually correct. Then another paper is doing similar for uh, TNAM. We have uh, invented this, what we call 10 ternary number. It's a number that can be zero, one, or don't care. And we also have this mathematical operation on them. So this was also full multi-page uh, proof uh, that uh, what verifier is doing is correct. So I think this is pretty cool. So university is doing it. Um, there is another interesting uh, development that is happening because VPF is ubiquitous. Uh, it sparked uh, creation of many security startups, and some startups are doing it uh, in uh, peculiar way. So uh, this is the quote from one of the blog posts of one of the startups, not going to name which one. This is not the marketing conference. Uh, so they call it offensive BPF. The whole article first describes that BPF has this offensive capabilities. You can attack the kernel this way. They describe everything. And then they're saying, to prevent this attack, you got to use our product. And it's using BPF underneath. So at the end, they're saying, like, BPF is bad. Use BPF to protect from BPF. <laughs> okay, let's uh, skip your slides. So uh, LSM, like BPF LSM. Um, despite, so like as I was saying, there are not that many public uh, open source examples of how to use it. Uh, this one is from systemd. So systemd is using LSM file open hook. And their use case is to deny access to a particular file system. If you follow recent uh, kernel summit mailing list discussion over the last like several weeks, there is a whole debate between file system maintainers, everyone, including Linux, uh, XFS, like whole kernel community of maintainers, like arguing when and how to remove file systems. So system D was not waiting for the discussion to end. Many years ago, they said, this false system is bad, this false system we don't trust, and this is how they do it in system D. As magic is a magic of the false system, you can see this is a whole code. Like I skipped like few lines here just so as to fit it on a slide, but they check, well, if false system is this, and it's part of the in allow list or deny list, just like deny, that's it. So. Uh, another interesting security check that systemd does is very similar to allow deny of the file system based on type, but allow deny um, uh, network interfaces. And here it's very similar from like security perspective, but it's not using LSM hook. In this case, it's using this C group uh, networking hooks. But uh, the code, this is the whole code. Here I didn't need to like remove any lines. This is the whole code copy paste from systemd. Uh, check if index, and if index is one of in my like allow or deny, then that's it. So that's the whole program. Here it should be very easy to like understand and to write. And typically some example also looks like this. It will be like file open or BPRM creates or for exec or for a file, just check something, read it, and then return zero or not. So the security. Is, so, so the important example here from the system D, this and this one, is not only so that BPF uh, users not only use LSM hooks, they use all kinds of other hooks to enforce security, whether it's like networking, it's bind connects and receive, but they also use tracing hooks that are read only from the kernel perspective, but they're using them as an additional aid to get more information, to understand what is like going on in the kernel, and based on this collective decision, um, they later you use LSM stuff. Uh, and a uh, few security recommendations. Uh, this one is more, it's real, so you can type this stuff and it will work. Uh, what it does, it, in all kernels now, there is a fail, uh, fault injection facility. You can type the sequence of commands and it will uh, completely prohibit any of the BPF system calls. So if uh, some people are extremely worried about BPF, like this startup that says, 
BPF is bad, don't use BPF, or use BPF, just disable it this way. But realistically, uh, I think the true security recommendation is kernel modules should really be written as BPF programs. The advantage, disadvantage of pros and cons of kernel modules is like arbitrary C code, you can crash anything, you can sex anything. So it's a plus, obviously, uh, unlike BPF that restricts you heavily, but it uh, can crash. Whereas like on the BPF side, its uh, safety is built in and they are portable. Uh, portable is also not, I would say, uh, people who'd never worked in a hyperscaler um, in a big cloud don't appreciate this portability part. It's, um, for example, in Metafleet, we have uh, several main versions that could, uh, are installed on 95% of the fleet, but there is always long tail. We have hundreds of the uh, uh, all the kernel versions. And developers of VPF programs, they don't want to uh, massage their program for 100 different kernels. For the kernel module, we would have to do it. Kernel module, we have to be done for a particular kernel version. It have to be recompiled for kernel version. Whereas in BPF, we have this facility called compile once run everywhere. The program, once it's compiled, can be loaded and auto-adjusted on the fly when it's loaded to a particular kernel. So this portability of the BPF programs is super critical for the uh, hyperscaler in big cloud. So um, I will skip this and this. And since I'm out of time, um, statement here. So we believe that the flavor, the BPF flavor of C language is a better choice for the kernel programming. This extended C that we did uh, with uh, safety built in is more secure C. And that's the true security recommendation I have. That's it. Any questions? Oh, we're out of time for questions. Okay, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm here, it um, was today, so grab me at any time, happy to chat.